Well, today I'm going to speak on America's favorite verse. No, it's not John 3, 16. It's Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Now, all of us have probably been judged by others, perhaps unfairly. We've been at the receiving end of those indulging in the favorite pastime of many of judging others. And in the days of social media, where everyone is an expert, we like to give our own ideas and pass judgment on all kinds of things. And so there's an abundance, particularly on social media, of vitriol, of hatred, of judgments being given. And can I say before we go any further, let me give you some principles from the Word of God as you would speak, as you would disagree with others, whether you're speaking to the person, or whether you're talking about the person behind their back, or whether you're putting something on social media. Remember this, as a follower of Jesus, everything you do is to be done in love. Whatever you say, whatever you post, is to be loving. And it's certainly to be truthful, because as followers of Jesus, we're committed to truth. Also, the Word of God tells us that as we speak, we're to give grace to those who hear. Do you do that? Are those posts of yours on social media bringing grace to those who hear? Are they written in the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are they advancing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, this morning we're going to hear directly from the lips of our Lord Jesus something about judgment. And so I want us, first of all, uh, to read the first six verses of Romans chapter 7. And if you're at home, uh, can you just read them out loud uh, with me as we think of these very, very important verses? Uh, and Chelsea, in that wonderful song, picks up some of the themes of this passage. Our Lord Jesus says, "'Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. This is the Word of God to us today from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. First of all, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus is saying, don't be judgmental. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. Now, what do these verses mean? Well, this word judge, used by our Lord here, is a very interesting word. It can refer to making a technical legal decision, rendering a verdict, coming to a conclusion. And so, Jesus is talking about someone who is judging someone in a very critical, harsh, censorious way. This person, can we say, is the fruit inspector whose speciality is locating and condemning the bad fruit. Uh, he seems to ignore the, the good fruit, but he looks and finds something to criticize. He looks at the bad fruit. If he's in a garden of flowers, beautiful flowers, invariably he looks at the weed. He points to the weed, and he says how terrible it is that there is a weed in this garden. Now, some of you have read Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. If you've never read that amazing book, you need to do so. Uh, do it uh, through the summer. You can take it to the beach and surprise people and uh, read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. But he has this wonderful uh, character in it called the Mudraker. I think we have an illustration of it. Here is the man, says John Bunyan, a man that could look no way but downwards with a muckrake in his hand. 
I see the crown above him, but he's ignoring the crown. He's not looking up to the sky. He's looking down in the muck, and he rakes in the muck. He is the muck raker. And this is the great joy and blessing of God because he's always looking down. Do you know people like that? Always looking down. Are you that kind of individual? Uh, you love to criticize. You're quite brilliant at criticizing, in fact. Uh, you rarely encourage anyone. If you do encourage someone, uh, you always swiftly follow it with a negative. All of us have been approached by someone who says something positive, and we think, well, this is surprising. I didn't know this person felt like that. But they give the compliment, and then invariably, this is what they really want to say, is the negative, critical, censorious, and harsh. Gravitating to the negative rather than the positive. This individual's judgment is harsh, as I say. It is critical, and it is condemning. And of course, when this individual does this, when we do it, we are self-righteous. We put ourselves in the position of a judge. What is Jesus saying? Do not be judgmental. Stop it. It's wrong. Whether you're saying it to someone, if you're talking behind their back, if you're posting it on social media, stop it. It's wrong. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Who are you to set yourself up as the judge? Paul says in Romans 14, verse 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? You think you're better than an individual, and you're going to pass judgment on that brother or sister. And Paul is saying, and the Lord is saying, who are you to do that? Are you the authority? Why is it that you think your views, your opinions matter more than anyone else. Who made you the arbiter in these circumstances? Why do you look down on others? You say, well, I really don't. Yes, you do. When you're judgmental, when I'm judgmental, I'm looking down on the other person. I think I'm superior to you if I'm acting in a judgmental way. And Jesus is saying, stop it. Don't do it. Judge not that you be not judged. Now, remember the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus has gathered his disciples. So he's not talking to the Pharisees. Yes, the Pharisees were very judgmental, but he's driving this home. He's talking to those who are following him, to those who are in the kingdom of heaven. He refers to your brother three times in our passage, as we read in verses 3, 4, and 5. This judgmental attitude, it destroys relationships, doesn't it? I remember in a previous church, a young woman was serving on a church committee, and uh, she was in tears. Uh, she had uh, given her opinion on a certain matter at a committee meeting, and uh, an individual, an older man, in fact, a deacon who should have known better, ripped into her and was so critical that she had the young lady in tears, and he thought that this was all right. He was judgmental. He was harsh. He was condemning the woman and her opinion. And I met with a man privately and admonished him for such a judgmental and destructive attitude and such, such words. And he said, well, yes, it's all true, but that's, that's the kind of person I am. I'm a very negative person. And I said, it's time to change. Don't be judgmental. Now, Having said what the verses mean, let me tell you what they don't mean. Jesus is not saying that we should abandon our critical faculties. There are things which are right, and there are things which are wrong, which are clearly stated in the Word of God. And yes, there is time to make a judgment. There's a difference between making a judgment and being judgmental. For example, we're going to see in uh, two or three weeks, uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in verses 15 through 20 of Matthew 7, he, he refers to false prophets. And he says in verse 20, you will recognize them by their fruits. 
Uh, that's making a judgment. There are false people who are giving false teaching, and Jesus is warning about them. And throughout the Word of God, there are warnings against false teaching. Uh, there's warnings against false prophets. Uh, there's warnings against sinful conduct. So, from this pulpit, when I preach against false doctrine, when I preach against sinful conduct as defined by the Word of God, don't quote Matthew 7 verse 1 to me. That's not the context. That's not what Jesus is saying. When there is unrepentant sin in the Corinthian church, Paul said that that individual had to be removed from the fellowship of the church. He writes, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? 1 Corinthians 5 verse 12. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, when there are disputes between brothers in the church, they're not to go to the secular uh, law courts for judgment. They are to judge these matters themselves. So there's a time for judgments. Let's look at it another way. Millions of people, including myself, have said that what happened to George uh, Floyd was unjust, it was brutal, it was criminal, and obviously it was clearly wrong. That's making a judgment. Can someone in these circumstances say, oh, judge not that you be not judged? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. If that's what Jesus is saying, there would be no judgments in law courts. There would be no condemnation of moral wrongs such as racism or, Bruce, or police brutality or looting. Our Lord Jesus says in John 7, verse 24, let me read it to you. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Yes, there is a time to make a right judgment in accordance with the Word of God. So, in terms of discrimination or racism, we can make a judgment because it is clear from Scripture uh, that God doesn't discriminate based on race or color, that there is one gospel, that there is one body of Christ. Now, what reason uh, does Jesus give in these verses, verses 1 and 2, for not being judgmental? Look again at verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Now, just think of that. If you are judgmental, others will judge you. And certainly, every single one of us is accountable to God. He is the ultimate judge, and His judgment is perfect. And so, whoever we are, each one of us on a future day is going to stand before the perfect judge. Now, what kind of judgment do you want from God? But who are you, meantime, to judge other people? Uh, do you know their motives? When you say that person is proud, uh, when, uh, when you say that person is bad, do, do, you know the, do you know the motives? Do you, do you know all the circumstances? We don't know the reason why people do certain things. And often, our assessment, our judgment of others is wrong. That's why it's very, very important when we disagree with someone, uh, someone who looks at things differently from us, that we learn to listen carefully, particularly to those with whom we disagree. Rather than making a snap judgment, uh, rather than making a statement based on your prejudice or your bias, take a step back. Judge not that you be not judged. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew was the former uh, prime minister in Singapore. He was a, he was a, a brilliant and a shrewd uh, politician. I remember one time he was being interviewed uh, on television, and the interviewer uh, said to him about the qualities that go into being a successful politician. And the interviewer said, well, the, the, the good politician knows what way the wind is blowing. Uh, we see that with the polls, <laughs> and uh, the politician then follows uh, the way the wind is blowing. And Lee Kuan Yew said, well, you know, the bamboo sways in the wind. It doesn't break. It's very, very tall, 
Other trees may break in the wind, but the bamboo doesn't. And Lee Kuan Yew said, I, I understand that there are bamboos, in fact, which can move before the wind comes. And he said, the very good politician uh, is able to move in the direction of the wind even before the wind comes. A very shrewd politician. But this is what he said in the context of judging. He said, I cannot judge what he did because I did not have his information. Isn't that a wise statement? I cannot judge what he did because I did not have his information. Before you judge, be careful. Do you have all of the information? Do you have all the facts? Do you understand the situation? Before you make that snap judgment, Proverbs 18, verse 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. You quickly post that on social media. It's very destructive. Uh, you say it in anger. Uh, you show your prejudice, and you've given an answer before you really have heard the issue. Proverbs 18, verse 17, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. In other words, uh, here's a situation, and you want to make a judgment, and you really only have listened to one side. You just listen to your friends. Uh, you make your judgment based on, on, on your own prejudices and desires, and you, you haven't heard from the other side. You imagine a court where a judge only hears from one side. That's a very bad judge. No, don't do that. Judge not that you be not judged. You see, when you're judgmental, uh, you are, we are presuming that we know everything about the person. And we don't. The person that you're very harsh with may be in pain, may have come through a terrible situation. You may have seen them at their very worst moment. Uh, they, they may come from a horrible background. And there you are, passing a harsh judgment on them. You do not know the motivation. And remember that you'll be judged by God. Why is it, even in the Christian community, we are so apt when we hear something negative about someone, we're so apt to believe the worst about that brother or sister? That's not right, is it? Love covers a multitude of sins. You know if you love someone. No, you don't excuse the wrongdoing, but you don't make a snap judgment. Judge not that you be not judged. Now look at verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That is, Jesus is saying, the standard by which you judge others will be the standard by which you're judged. Now, that's fair, isn't it? If you've got high expectations of others, you can't complain when they hold you to that same high standard. If you've judged them based on a certain standard, who are you to complain when you're held to that same standard? It was the old proverb, those living in glass houses shouldn't throw, st shouldn't throw stones. Let me ask you this. In terms of dealing with others, do you want mercy or justice? We've been singing, we mean worshiping about God's mercy. And in terms of your dealing with others, particularly when there's disagreement, uh, particularly when you, you see things from a different perspective, do you want mercy or do you want judgment. You see, you're far more likely to receive mercy from others if you yourself have been merciful to them. Isn't that what Jesus said in one of the Beatitudes? Chapter 5, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's it. Paul says in Romans 2, verse 1, in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Yes. Here is an individual then. They love to condemn others, uh, to listen to them. You think they were an angel just flown in from heaven. They're so self-righteous. 
They're always right. Their opinion is the most important in the room. And in that very convicting passage in Romans 2, I, I commend it to you, Paul is saying, don't be so fast. Judging and passing judgment on another, you are condemning yourself. In other words, it is reversed. On the other hand, if you are merciful to others, you're more likely to receive mercy. That's true, isn't it? To think of your dealing with others. Just think of it if you're an employee or if you're a boss or even in your home. With the measure you meet, it will be measured to you. Now, this is Father's Day, and I want to encourage fathers. And I think we have. But isn't it the case, men, that we are apt to be more critical, more harsh, more judgmental than our wives, than our mothers, than our sisters. I think that's true, isn't it? The dads out there, are you a harsh critic of your wife? I've met men who are. Their, their wife can do nothing wrong, and they pick, pick, pick. They're so much wonderful in their marriage, but they look at their wife, and they, they condemn her. They find fault. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's going to produce a very unhappy home. What about the way, men, you deal with your, your children? They're not perfect. Of course they're not. All have sinned, including your children. All mess up, all fail. What is your relationship with them? How do your children view you? Or do they see you as a, as, a, as a just man, but a rather harsh man, uh, an enforcer of rules, rather than a man of love and of compassion and of kindness. That produces a good home. Because if you in your home are harsh and critical with your children, they are much more likely to be harsh and critical with their children. And if you're the kind of individual that had a dad that was very, very hard on you, that you could never please, that was very judgmental, you're apt to bring that into your marriage and into your home. This is so important, isn't it? Jesus is saying, don't be judgmental. The Chelsea sang that beautiful song uh, that she wrote two or three years ago, and it comes from this passage, but it also comes from James chapter 2, verse 13. Listen to this. For judgment is without mercy to him who has shown no mercy. With the measure you meet will be measured to you. Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy, don't you love this, triumphs over judgment. What do you want from your friends, from your family? Justice? Or I, want, I want mercy, because I mess up sometimes. And certainly with God. If I get justice from God, I'm in hell because I'm a sinner. No, I don't want justice. Yes, God is a just God and has provided a way where His justice is maintained, because what I deserve falls on His Son, but I, through the death, and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, receive mercy because God is abundant in mercy. And in my relationships and in your relationships, surely in your family where you work, and certainly in the church, as we go out into our world, we don't want to be known as people who are censorious, as self-righteous Pharisees, as denouncing everyone in a harsh, critical way with some of these terrible postings on social media that Christians do and get caught up in all of the, the hate and the, and the violence and the prejudice that is characteristic of so much of our society. We're not to be like that, no. We're to be people of mercy, people of grace. Yes, of justice, but justice based not on our own ideas, not on our prejudices, but on the solid Word of God. So there's the first, coming from the first two verses, don't be judgmental. Now, Jesus develops this beautifully 
and almost humorously in verses 3 through 5, where he says, don't be a hypocrite. First, don't be judgmental. Secondly, don't be a hypocrite. Verse 3, uh, Jesus gives an illustration, a brilliant illustration uh, of his point. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eyes? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And Jesus gives an illustration here. It's a kind of parable, isn't it? And for the point of emphasis, uh, Jesus presents an almost ridiculous situation. Uh, an individual has a plank of wood in his eye, and it's obvious to everyone but he seems to be in blissful ignorance of his terrible defect. So he's got this big plank of wood in his eye, but then he looks at his brother, although he can't see very clearly because of the plank, and he sees a tiny speck in his brother's eye. That speck in his brother's eye is almost indiscernible, but he's able to see it. And then he approaches his brother to take that little speck out of his eye. The whole thing is laughable. And that's the point of the illustration, isn't it? Hey, Bob. Or is it Bubba? I've never seen that word before, Bob. Uh, Hey, Bubba. I think he's from the South, y'all. Hey, Bob, you have a little something in your eye there. I mean, that's the point. Jesus is using humor to make the point. It's ridiculous. Who would be uh, so insensitive to do that? I've got this huge plank in my eye, and... I'm focused on that tiny, tiny splinter of wood in your eye. You get it, don't you? You understand it. Notice what Jesus says, verse 5. You hypocrite. You hypocrite. That's strong, isn't it? We understand the Pharisees and the scribes were hypocrites. Uh, Jesus is going to make that clear in chapter 23 of Matthew. But now he's addressing you and me. When we do that, we are hypocrites. Now, if you're going to deal with that tiny speck in your brother's eye, first deal with that huge log in your own eye. You see, our own faults are more difficult to see than other people's faults, aren't they? In fact, we can be guilty of the same fault, and we see it in someone else, and we miss it in ourselves. Furthermore, taking the speck out of your brother's eye, that's a good thing to do. But taking the speck out of your brother's eye is a matter requiring prayerful sensitivity, care, compassion. It's to be done with a a desire to help your brother, not to wound him, not to humiliate him, not to publicize that tiny little fault that he has. But the man who's got the plank in his own eye, Mr. Judgmental, he lives in blissful ignorance of his own situation. You, you can think of some people like that, can't you, uh, around you? Uh, are they, it's quite amazing, isn't it? Uh, they go around passing judgment on others very, very strongly, and they even want to publicize it. And everyone sees that big log in your eye. Do you you get the point? Why is it that we're so quick to condemn others? Why is it we're so quick to judge others and ignore the huge flaw, the huge sin, the huge failure in ourselves? It's hypocrisy. It's ignorance. It's sin. Stop. Here it is. Here's what I want you to understand. Stop exaggerating the sins of others. Stop focusing on the flaws of others, and stop minimizing your own failures. If your goal is to help your brother, that's a good goal. But first, says Jesus, before you go to that brother, before you go to that sister, before you write that nasty post on social media, before you send that email, Before you criticize your brother behind his back or even to his face, Jesus is saying, there's something that you must do. Take that huge log out of your own eye. And now, with prayer, with sensitivity, with care, 
and with love for the well-being of that brother or that sister, go to them. Paul deals with that in Galatians. In Galatians 6, verse 1, he says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should gossip about them, criticize them, send them a nasty email, post it on social media so everyone knows how bad they are. No, it's not what you're saying. You're saying, who would do that? Many are doing it. Many are doing it. And if you're doing it, stop it. Judge not that you be not judged. Listen to Paul. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is Paul saying? Keep a watch on yourself. Deal with yourself. And as you go to that brother with that fault who has committed that transgression, uh, who's got a speck or a log in his eye, as it were, do that carefully, and first deal with your own sin. That happens in the church, doesn't it? Here is someone who has failed, and perhaps they feel humiliated. Perhaps it's difficult for them even to come uh, to Calvary Church. Uh, they wonder how they're going to be dealt with. How wonderful to have brothers and sisters who get beside that person in the spirit of gentleness and remove that speck from their eyes. Paul's, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 18, uh, when your brother has sinned, uh, you go to your brother privately. <laughs> privately. Don't put it on social media. Don't tell others. You go to your brother privately. And what's the goal? The goal is to win your brother. The goal is to gain your brother. Don't you want friends like that? Don't you want spiritual leaders like that? Don't you want friends like that? Uh, don't you want fathers and mothers and children like that? Not hypocrites, but coming in love. This is the Spirit of Christ. So first, don't be judgmental. Secondly, don't be a hypocrite. And third, be discerning. Verse 6, do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. It, it, I, I read that, and I, I thought, yes, I'm, I'm with the Lord. I understand the principle in the first two verses. I understand his uh, almost humorous illustration, which drives home the point in verses three, 3 through 5, but verse 6 seems a bit out of it, doesn't it, on the face of it? It seems to have nothing to do with what precedes or what follows. But I think this is the point. That's a very important point. While we are not to be judgmental, and certainly not to be hypocritical, we are to be discerning. A follower of Jesus is to be an individual of discernment. And Jesus gives an example about this. Now, the dogs mentioned here are not your cuddly golden retriever pet at home. That's not the picture. Uh, this is a picture of, of, of dogs. They're, they're vicious dogs. They're wild dogs. They, they, they go around trying to get food, and they are, are wild dogs, vicious dogs. And then there are the pigs. This is not your friendly little pig lit in the in the farm, just nice and pink and cuddly. No, this is a wild pig, again, vicious. That's the, pic the picture. Wild dogs and wild pigs. And they are, of course, ceremonially unclean. Now, here's the point. Why would you take that which is holy? Why would you take that which is of great value? Why would you take something of, of uh, beauty, like pearls, and uh, throw them uh, to the dogs, throw them to the pigs. I mean, if you throw the pearls to the pigs and to the dogs, certainly to the pigs, you know what the pigs are going to do? They're going to try and eat them. Because a pig will virtually eat anything. But it's not going to eat pearls. Pearls cannot be, be chewed, and they're going to 
spit them out, and then, says Jesus, they'll trample them underfoot. So you take that which is holy, that which is beautiful, that which is of great value, and you throw them uh, to these wild, ugly, vicious animals, these wild dogs and wild pigs. And they don't eat them, no, they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. That's interesting, isn't it? What's holy? What, what are the pearls? I think the pearls are the gospel of that which is great value. Jesus is going to use an illustration in Matthew 13 about the man who searched for the pearl, uh, an illustration of the kingdom of God. He's referring, as it were, to the pearl of great price, to the glorious message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How foolish it would be to take something holy, something of value, something of beauty, and present it to people who are going to mock you, who are going to savage you, and who are going to treat the gospel in a vile way. I think that's the point. Be discerning. Don't do that. I've had that of presenting the gospel to people and being ridiculed. Uh, they, they, they understand the gospel in, in theory. Not only do they reject it, Many people reject the gospel. No, these are, these are mockers. These are vile people. These are people who are going to, to swear and possibly even attack you. Now, it's true. And Matthew is going to make that very clear throughout his gospel and uh, coming to a brilliant summary in Matthew chapter 28. It's true we who are followers of Jesus Christ are to take the gospel to all the nations. It's true that God loves everyone. And that we, as God opens doors and He gives us strength, we are to present the gospel to everyone. This message reverberates around the whole world. It embraces the whole world. That's true. But as we live the Christian life, and as we seek to share the gospel with others, we are to be discerning. Not judgmental, not hypocritical, but discerning. There are people, I've known them, I'm sure some of you know them, there are people who not only reject the gospel, but are offensive, are vulgar, and vicious. And when that happens, it's time to leave such people. Don't continue to throw your pearls before pigs. For example, in Matthew chapter 10, as Jesus is sending out the disciples, He tells them, listen, if you come to a place and they don't hear, hear from you, what are you to do? You're to shake the dust from your feet and you're to move on. Listen to the apostles, for example, in Acts 18, verse 6. Here's Saul and Timothy arriving from Macedonia with Paul, and he's testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Verse 6, and when they opposed and reviled, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He has presented the message. They reject it. Not only do they reject it, they, as it were, trample it underfoot, and they turn to attack the messenger, and then it's time to move. Perhaps you have family, friends, colleagues at work, and God has given you the opportunity to communicate the gospel. I trust you're doing that. But not only are they not receptive, they're like attack dogs. They love to belittle you. They love to insult you. Uh, they love, as it were, to trample the gospel under feet. Then it's time to stop. Remember what Peter says to the woman in 1 Peter 3? Here's a Christian woman, and her husband's an unbeliever. Uh, what's she to do? To, to, uh, to keep preaching to him? To keep sharing the gospel? No, he says, no. And he can be one without a word. Uh, uh, there's a time to stop. There's a time to move on. There's a time to say, no, I'm going to end this discussion. I I'm going to leave the room. I I'm going to leave the town. That requires discernment. This is not a formula, but it's very important as we share the gospel to understand that there are people who hate the gospel, not only reject it, 
Not saying, well, I'll think about it. Thank you for this interaction. You've given me some things to think about. No, we continue uh, to communicate and dialogue with such people, but those who attack you and who are vile and vicious and vulgar, it's time to stop. It's time to stop casting your pearls before the pigs. Be discerning. What have we learned this morning? Three important lessons, very practical for all of us. None of us can say, this doesn't apply to me. Lesson number one, don't be judgmental. Lesson number two, do not be a hypocrite. Stop judging others. Deal with yourself first. And third, be discerning. And with the help of God the Spirit, may we at Calvary Church not be judgmental. I pray that this church, all churches, and certainly Calvary Church, is not a judgmental church. It's not a church where we condemn people, but we stand strong on the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the compassion of God and welcome all people. Yes, welcome sinners, just as God has welcomed us sinners into His family, so that people who come who are broken, who are bruised, who are hurting, yes, who have messed up, will receive the message of the gospel, the love of God poured into their hearts. Does that mean that we minimize the message? Absolutely not. We stand strong on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We stand strong that this is the Word of God. We stand strong against false teaching and false teachers, but we point people to our Lord Jesus Christ where they will receive grace, forgiveness, and compassion, and that we in turn, as we go into our families and our streets, are not known as those who condemn, as not known as people of prejudice, who are critical, who are censorious, but people of love, people of grace, people of mercy. You see, all of us deserve the judgment of God because all have sinned. I love John 3, 16, but I love John 3, 17. Uh, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's really my favorite verse, but the next verse comes close. John 3, 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. In the New American Standard Version, it says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world, should, but that the world through Him, that is through Jesus, might be saved. And that word judge or condemned in our version is the same word that Jesus uses in John in Matthew 7 verse 1, where He says, Judge not that you be not judged. No, we are not to judge. but the great judge who sees us in our sin and knows that we deserve judgment. You and I deserve God's eternal judgment, eternal separation in the lake of fire. But in the miracle of the gospel, the unique gospel, when God sends His Son into this world, our blessed Savior comes not to judge, not to condemn. Who are you then to condemn when God in Christ doesn't condemn you? And so He sends His Son not to condemn us, not to judge us, not to throw us into hell where we deserve, but He comes to save. He comes to save. And for those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. How is it that God is able not to judge us because my blessed Savior, the sinless Christ, takes my judgment. He dies in my place. He is the unique one. He is the perfect one. You know, today, people are tearing down these statues and saying, well, these historical figures uh, were basically sinful people. They got it wrong, and they're absolutely right, because I don't know of any single person throughout human history, throughout the Bible, take Abraham, take David, take Moses, 
and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single person is flawed, has failed, has prejudice, has done wrong things. Into such a world comes Jesus. And if you've never received His forgiveness, will you do that? Perhaps you feel condemned, and perhaps Christians have said hard things to you, and you feel really estranged from the church, estranged from God. Let me say to you that today the Lord Jesus in love welcomes you. Will you come with your brokenness? Will you come with your sin and come to the cross and cry out to Christ to save you? And He will do that. Not only will He save you, but He will give you the gift of His Spirit so that as you live your life, that love and that mercy will be displayed to others. May we, who are followers of Christ then, not be people of condemnation, not people of judgment, but people of love and compassion. That is the way of Christ. Father, we thank You. We, we stand condemned. Each one of us have judged others harshly. We've said things. We've written things about others prematurely, not knowing their motives. Forgive us, Father, and we thank You for our Lord Jesus Christ, and that through Him we can be saved. May even now the doors of hearts be opened, and Christ coming, bringing salvation and forgiveness. Strengthen us, Father, as we go into this dark world, this world of hurt, this world of insult, this world of recriminations, and bear the beauty and the love and the compassion of our magnificent Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.